This is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 74 of the Rebel Author Podcast. This week, I'm talking to Joanna Penn all about how to write an author business plan. And I get quite giddy and excited at the beginning of this episode because, like many of us in the industry, uh, Joanna has been one of those mentors from afar. um, And I have always looked up to her, and I think she's amazing and fantastic. And you can definitely hear that in my voice at the beginning of this episode where I'm like obviously fangirling her. So yeah, I'm sure you'll all have a giggle uh, at me giddy with excitement as this episode begins. And also, can we just pause for a second? Episode 74? What the fuck? I I cannot believe we are almost at, well, A75, but B, that means we're super close to 100. And just wow, it has gone so fast, like so fast. I really wasn't sure when I started this how many episodes I was going to get done. I mean, I knew I wanted to hit 100, but (laughs) when you start something new, you never really know if you're capable of doing it, I suppose. But uh, yes, so I am super excited and we'll have to do some ridiculously exciting uh, celebration thingy when we get to either 100 or I suppose 104, because then it's two years. God, I, two years. I can't believe I've almost been doing this for two years. I'm, this is all crazy. Crazy, I tell you. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, last week's question was, what is your favourite swear word? And I, it did make me giggle, but I genuinely think this may have been the question of the week that's <laughs> had the most responses. I have no idea why, you cheeky rebels, you. Uh, I think uh, I may have found my people who like swearing. Also, I just want to add, actually, that um, I posted a poll on Instagram asking people whether or not they loved swearing or they thought it was terrible, etc. And it was virtually unanimous and it was the most (laughs) interactive, no, most engaged poll I've ever done. I literally had hundreds of people (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> click swearing which I just I just fucking love for you guys like brilliant brilliant anyway so Scott Kavanagh says uh he likes the c-word particularly from Billy Connolly um and who else we okay so we've got Erin McKnight whose uh favorite swear word is more of a phrase but that she uses as a single word which is son of a fucking whore um and yes she purposefully left out the spaces so I hope I uh oh so that the words fly out of the mouth so I hope I did your uh swear word justice um Linda says her favorite swear word in her language is curva or maybe I've I, I, there was probably a, an, a, a rolled R in there. So I apologise if I said that terribly badly, uh, which is a really awful expression for a woman who would lie with a man for compens- compensation. But her favourite English swear word is uh, twat muffin and uh, another one. Uh, what else? Fuck is Tom Fowler's favourite word. And uh, <laughs> Andrew says... Do I need my headphones to listen to that episode, episode 73, which, yes, yes, you really do need headphones. Do not listen with children around. Oh, um, okay. So literally, oh my goodness me, there are so many uh, swears in here. Okay, I cut a few more. So we've got Penny who says, uh, two classics, son of a pup. I love this. I just point out that son of a is one of my favorite swears because you can be so creative with it like you can literally put son of an anything after it and uh it's funny and yeah brilliant um what else okay so penny adds uh, motherfucker fuck me sideways uh what else um a new one that she came across uh, from a bbc funny video uh calling womankind the clitorati love that one <laughs> Um, okay what else have we got ass butt from Jen Conda (laughs) that's brilliant Uh, I'm just gonna cackle my way through these okay uh, Megan Johnson says dick ninja brilliant Um, what else have we got here Uh, 
you sneaky bastard from Jeff Elkins. Love it. This is in, particularly in reference to when your children are being cheeky. Um, oh, fuck nugget. That's another brilliant one. Okay. Ah, uh, literally, guys, you made my absolute day uh, posting all of these. So yes, thank you so much. I've had a right giggle uh, reading them all. All right, let's move on. So the question of the week this week is, do you actually have an author business plan? If not, why not? Uh, and if yes, did you did you find it easy enough to do? Um, how long did you have it from the start? Yeah, tell me, do you guys have business plans? And of course, the book recommendation of the week this week is Joanna's book, Your Author Business Plan. Uh, I've read it, I loved it. So yes, I definitely recommend that you give it a read. Okay, in personal update this week, it has been school half term week and my amazing mum uh, is in our uh, childcare support bubble. So she has taken uh, my son for a few days and I have managed to get work done. I continued with the time blocking. I've had a very lovely email actually uh, from a listener. So thank you very much for that email. I haven't replied yet um, about some suggestions for te- tweaking my time blocking, which uh, I am going to be doing next week. And I think I definitely had some teething problems, but uh, I do broadly like the time blocking. I'm frustrated this week because I didn't get as much done as well I did last week but I think also that is because of half term. I have been working on side characters. I am I feel like I'm getting closer to the end now. Uh, The previous week I was just tearing my hair out because the fucking book has expanded beyond any length that I anticipated it uh, was going to be. I thought it was going to be about 40,000 words like heroes and villains and actually it's well on track to be closer to the size of prose Um, but it's important to me to make sure the books are as comprehensive as possible and so goodbye deadline and uh, yeah I will be racing towards the end of Uh, the book hopefully over the next couple of weeks I really would like to get it done before the end of February because I was also supposed to edit another book this month (sighs) but such is life Uh, so yes I I mean that yeah yeah (laughs) hopefully I'm gonna get to the end of side characters very soon and I have already started turning my uh, attention to the marketing plan for that and uh, doing some exciting things for the launch. I've also been recording and sorting out the audiobook of Villains. Uh, I It's really tricky because I use my voice an awful lot uh, with podcasting and interviewing people and I'm in the midst of uh, a interview block. So I tend to interview lots of people all in close succession and then... Um, I don't interview for a while. I'm actually finding it quite hard to have my voice in good enough condition that I can record for a period of time. So yes, but I am, you know, I'm I'm making my way through it and I'm still hopeful that I'll have it done by the end of March and then um, hopefully be launching it in April time and moving on obviously to uh, record the rest of my nonfiction books in audio. I have also been uh, preparing up a secret project which I will announce um, maybe in the next episode. If not the next episode then very definitely the episode after. Uh, I'm just waiting for one final element before uh, I can Uh, announce it but it's going to be interactive and I hope that lots and lots and lots of you will get involved in it so yes I'm very excited for that it's very much a rebellious uh project so yes I'm I am I know I appreciate I'm being an absolute dick at this point by teasing you but I hope it means that you'll all listen in next week uh, so that you can find out what this very exciting collaborative secret project is. So oh and if you're a patron then you'll already know because I've already announced it to my patrons. Uh, Yes okay I think that's probably it uh, from me in terms of personal updates so let's move on. The Rebel of the Week this week is Mark Lefebvre. Mark says, In high school, I loved working for the school newspaper. 
When I was in grade 12, I ran to become editor. I didn't get voted in, so I started to produce my own version of the high school paper and I brought the newspaper into digital digital production for the first time ever. Okay, it was the mid-80s, computers were new. And I produced the paper on a Commodore 64. Prior to that, it was typed into onto a false cap uh, sized mimograph page. Oh my God, I'm, I hope I've pronounced that right. <laughs> How embarrassing. The newspaper was released four times per school year and was a huge cost centre because it was free and relied on funding from the student council to operate. The version was a legal sized photocopied monthly paper where uh, there were no photocopiers in the town I grew up in. Closest one was a 45 minute drive away and I charged 25 cents per paper and only produced 100 copies of it. Admittedly, our school only had 300 students students, but this meant it was in short supply, so always sold out. It was the first time in the high school's history that it was uh, monthly and operated its own budget. Rebel Indie Publishing in the 1980s, baby. I love this. I I love that you started it to spite, to spite the other favour as well. <laughs> just think that is absolute sheer brilliant rebellion uh yeah oh my goodness I I loved reading this also funnily enough uh I did something very similar and started a newspaper in my I think it was my middle school though so I was a bit younger I was maybe 11 or 12 it's almost like I was destined to be a writer (laughs) oh anyway Yes, loved it. Loved the rebellion. I love that you created a budget as well. And also clearly um, business and entrepreneurialism and entrepreneurialness was in your blood from your youth. If you would like to be a rebel of the week, please, please do send in your story. It can be any kind of rebellion, big, small or somewhere in between. You can email your rebel story to rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com or tweet me at rebelauthorpod. One new patron this week, welcome and a huge thank you to Stanley B. Trice. Uh, And of course, a massive thank you to all of my existing patrons. I really, really do appreciate it. I have also popped up the dates for the next few uh, Poison and Pros that are exclusive for patrons, uh, the kind of Q&A writing sessions that we're doing together. And I have also posted up The Secret Project, uh, which I know lots of you are very excited about. So yes, uh, if you are a patron and you haven't seen that, do log in and go and check uh, out what is going on. If you'd like to support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, then you can do so uh, from as little as $2 a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, so I'm going to play a little word from them and then we'll get on with my super excited, overly giddy episode with Joanna Penn. Hi, I'm Stephanie. And I'm Joni. And we're from the Kobo Writing Life podcast. Kobo Writing Life is Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. KWL was built by authors for authors. And our team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help authors reach new readers around the world. If you're looking for some tips on growing your indie publishing business this year, the Kobo Writing Life podcast is a great resource. We've talked to authors big and small and they always have something to teach us. One of my favorite episodes from the recent months was our conversation with Karen Slaughter, who's a best-selling crime author with years of experience. She discussed with us her career, delved into what makes a great crime novel, and she talked about the double standards imposed on female crime writers. Karen also told us about her nonprofit, Save the Libraries, and provided some great advice for aspiring authors. In episode 200, we interviewed Kobo CRM marketing manager, Christina Mendez, about marketing your books on a global scale. She provided tips for global messaging, the importance of being universal but not generic. She discusses the different tactic Kobo uses to market ebooks and audiobooks and explains how the Kobo recommendations algorithm works. My favorite part of the interview is when Christina shares her insights about what makes the Kobo customer unique. Spoiler alert, the Kobo customer is a voracious reader and they're constantly reading. They love to read long series and the most popular genres are romance and thrillers. If you want to learn more about Kobo Writing Life or our podcast, check out our blog and find us on social media. You can find our podcast on all podcast providers. If you're ready to start your self-publishing journey, you can create your free account at kobo.com slash writing life. Bye, Rebels.
Hello and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. I am p- practically besides myself with excitement for today's show. I have no other than Joanna Penn, Queen of the Indies, joining me today. So first, I'm going to tell you a very quick bit about Joanna. Joanna Penn writes nonfiction for authors and is an award-nominated New York Times and USA Today best-selling thriller author as J.F. Penn. She's also an award-winning podcaster, creative entrepreneur, and international professional speaker. She is also somebody who I 100% look up to and have been binge listening to her podcast for easily over half a decade. So um, it is a great honour and a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you, Sasha. And I really appreciate all that. And (laughs) it's so so funny because, you know, you hear your bio read and you're like, oh, that's quite interesting. But of course, (laughs) I should say like straight up, I I first started writing in 2006. So as of recording this, it's 15 years. (laughs) So if you don't achieve something in 15 years, then it's a bit of a worry. But no, thank you. That's lovely. Um, So talking of those 15 years, would you like to tell everyone a little bit um, about your journey and how you got to where you are today? I mean, I'm sure everybody has listened uh, to to you, but I (laughs) want to... Let's not assume. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. And if you guys also haven't uh, listened to The Creative Pen, what are you actually doing? Go and listen to it after the show. Uh, So yes, tell everyone about, uh, about your journey. Sure. Well, I think, you know, like everyone, I think I've always been a reader, so love reading, but had that thought that to be a writer, to be an author, you had to be uh, some kind of special person that you you know it couldn't possibly be something normal people did and so I wrote a lot of journals through all my years and then I went into a job as an IT consultant after university so I ended up implementing accounts payable systems around Europe and Asia Pacific um, so I ended up one of those six-figure corporate slaves uh, my job paid well but I, I just ended up creatively dead by the time I was sort of early 30s when I think you start to realize that if you don't sort your life out uh, you're just going to be miserable and so at that point I was like what what shall I do with my life this was around when Tim Ferriss uh, published the four-hour work week and that book had a big impact on me and I was like okay that's what I want to (laughs) do four-hour work week awesome but it was also when the internet started you know blogging uh, podcasting was sort of starting I wasn't really called that at the time and so so I, I started getting into this and I decided to write a book called um, How to Enjoy Your Job or Find a New One, which is a terrible title, but you know, <laughs> you have to start somewhere. So I wrote this book and then I discovered um, the publishing industry was not what I had hoped it was going to be. So that's when I started self-publishing. This was around 2008, which was before the international Kindle, before ebooks really took off, before digital audio, the iPhone was brand new. So this was in the early, early days. And then essentially, I got the bug and I, that's something I want to say to people like if you're just starting it, you really have to decide do I love writing books or not and if you do this is a great career mm. and so I started writing more started blogging started podcasting sharing my journey because as we know we all make mistakes so I started doing all that in 2011 I was able to leave my job uh, to become a full-time author entrepreneur because I have multiple streams of income as you know Uh, but um, it took me until 2015 before I got back to the same income and then since then pretty much uh, everything's been good so as we speak I'm almost at a decade of full-time author entrepreneur I've got over 30 books now uh, fiction and non-fiction and yeah just uh, super happy but I would say this is the the main thing you have to take these small steps and every day it feels really tiny like oh another 200 words like this morning I only did uh, you know edited one chapter I didn't feel like I achieved that much but it's another chapter you know Mm -hmm. so and by doing that day after day day after day and then the years go past super fast and suddenly here we are so hopefully that's encouraging to people yeah I think it is and you know this is a long-term game like being an indie and so it, I think it's really important always that we re- reiterate that this is a long journey and mm. um, you know but you can get what you want at the end of it. Um, so we're here to talk about one of your newer books your author business plan which I've read and I think it's fantastic. Um, I think business plans are one of those things that everybody knows is a good idea um, <laughs> like in principle uh, but they totally shy away from actually doing it because it can feel like this 
big and massive task and this big scary thing to do because it's what business people do and we're creatives and all of that stuff so I wondered if you can remove some of that stigma by explaining mm. like, I guess what a business plan and why it's so important to actually have one as an indie author yeah sure so first of all uh, it doesn't have to be you're not taking this to bank manager or putting it on the internet like you don't have to share your plan so it can be whatever you like so my first plan was a sort of a2 big sheet of yellow paper i think it was yellow and i put uh, i just used a big marker and i it was like a uh, had creative pen in the middle and then it had some arrows and some bubbles and that was literally it you can do a one page diagram which can take you two seconds um or not two seconds maybe 10 minutes and that can be your plan and that plan essentially got me through probably the first five years <laughs> And all it was is, okay, the creative pen. Well, what shall I do with it? I guess I'll write some books. That can go in a circle. I guess I'll have some audio. That can go in a circle. <laughs> and the, the idea, though, behind a business plan is, well, the word business, business is creative it, in itself. So you have to believe that. You also need to want to run a business and a business does make some profit. So when you're doing your plan, you don't need a plan if you're not intending to make a profit with your books. So let's assume that we do. And then it's a case of, okay, well then I need to think about what I'm going to create. So we're writers, that's brilliant. But we also do need to think about marketing. We need to think about the financials behind things. So if you want to take um, the business plan further than just the bubbles, it's then thinking about behind that okay what do I do uh, what do I need to do to create the book what do I need to do to market the book and what do I need to do to actually make money with my book but I think for me it has to be really high level high level and strategic and it does have to be more than just a dream I think one of the issues that many writers certainly I did just as much as anyone else is I'm going to write this book, just this one book, and I'm going to make a million. And I don't need a business plan because, <laughs> uh, I mean, obviously I'm going to get a Netflix deal and it will just be awesome. And that's just not, that's not a plan. <laughs> that is a dream. Uh, or for example, I, I'm award nominated, which I'm very proud of, but I really want to be award winning, but I can't plan to be an award winning writer. All I can do is plan to write the best books I can and submit them to competitions that I particularly want to and awards so that those are some tips I guess but the main thing is is to consider that this is this can be anything you like so if it's sticking with a you know just a page in your journal that is a good start so let's not overdo uh it in terms of like uh, anything scary <laughs> yeah I think <clears throat> excuse me I think um that is super clear. And I, I, you've kind of answered the second question as well, because I was going to ask, um, are there any things that we shouldn't include in, in our plan? And I think you've um, alluded that, well, not alluded, you've said that you, you shouldn't, there should be a difference between what's a dream and um, what is something concrete. So, and, I, and I guess, is that the, the main difference then? What goes into your plan is anything tangible that you have control over. And uh, what doesn't go into your plan are those um, like bigger long-term things like awards and um, I don't know, getting a Netflix deal. Yeah. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's face it, we all want a Netflix, yeah. Netflix deal. Um, but yes, in terms of a plan, yeah, the plan has to have things that you can actually do. And that I would also say what else doesn't go into a plan is all the detail. So for example, uh, you know, for me to say, okay, I'm going to write a really good thriller, I can write down, okay, I'm going to write this book this year. Um, and I'm going to book my editor, you know, I'm going to work with this particular editor so I put those in but what I don't write in my plan is going to be you know all the detail of how I'm going to write or for example I my goal is to market my books with, with say Facebook ads I can write down do Facebook ad course but I'm not going to write down all the steps of how to upload ads and you know all the nitty-gritty details of how to do something or how to self-publish I mean we know there are lots of technical tips and um, probably one of the biggest issues with a plan is that it gets too long like mm. seriously my plan for both I have two plans one for the creative pen and one for JF pen so that is something to consider um you're similar that you have fiction and non-fiction but seriously you should be able to put everything on one a4 page not really really tiny <laughs> 
<laughs> like not like eight point font. It should be a reasonable size font because the reality is you cannot do everything. And if you try and have a really long plan, this is why people get scared. It's because they think about everything that they could possibly do and it just becomes unwieldy and too much. Mm. So that would be another tip is uh, do not put everything into your plan. And if it's too long, you have to delete some stuff and it can <gasps> go on next year's plan or <laughs> some other plan because literally, I mean, we're recording this in, you know, in the beginning of January and I'm like, whoa, when I look at the, the weeks, there doesn't seem that much left in January already. <laughs> what's going on time flies etc even I, in covid times when we time is just elastic yeah it doesn't time is a lie i am um, i i there's part of me that that is like no when you said um you know you can't do everything because in my head i'm like well but i can like i will i must <laughs> do everything all of the things like i i swear i like part of me thinks i'm a cyborg and then like i break pieces of myself and then yeah. i realize that actually i'm not a cyborg and yeah well i think we're we're quite similar in this way which is why we get on and um i still think I'm superhuman as well I completely get it and basically my husband says I'm like um a sports car in that I can go really fast and then I hit a wall <laughs> yeah. and it all falls apart <laughs> so perhaps yeah. And yeah, I think you're pretty pretty similar you get it right I and really it might do. be better to just try and be like a Ford Fiesta or something and by then oh. the Ford Fiesta has just overtaken us because we went really fast and then we hit a wall so I think probably and I'm like a decade older than you so I'm wise obviously <laughs> and the, but every single year and I've been doing plans my whole blooming life um, and doing plans for this business for over a decade and every single year I write down do try and do less <laughs> <laughs> better do less better which is bad English but you know what I mean like you just you just can't do everything and obviously in terms of I've got another book on productivity I tend to write the books that I need for myself mm. uh, and one of them um, in productivity it's like okay you know eliminate and then outsource and then and sometimes you have to say no to yourself and this is a big exercise in a plan is um you know when people go oh well the most successful indies write a book a month well I'm gonna do that then and it's like well actually no I can't do that you know you and I are not Lindsay Baroka who's probably one of the most prolific indie authors writes 100,000 plus words a month um Lindsay, Lindsay is incredible and part of me I would love to be like that but that's not me and that's not you either because we do these different things um so you have to say okay well what am what can I do what do I really want to do what do I want to achieve in this plan and then you have to change what's in there and one of the good reasons for having a plan is to help you when you get into this oh, well, now I'll do this, now I'll do that, now I'll go and do this. And it's like, well, how does that fit into my plan? Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I mean, I'm so guilty of this just as much as you are. But it's like, okay, does that fit with my overarching goals? And perhaps this is one of the most important parts of the plan, which is really considering uh, what do you want to achieve? So, um, for example, this award-winning fiction author thing that I, I want, it's on my lifetime things well so I have to every month make sure I'm taking a step towards that which is becoming a better writer so I need to do more um, courses on writing I need to write more books I need to work with different editors to improve different parts of my process I need to read more award-winning books uh, so those are the types of things that I might put on my plan and then one of the interesting things for me this year is I put on my plan normally it's like make more money and this year I was like, I'm going to, I want to maintain my income at the same level while doing less work, <laughs> which is probably something that eventually you'll want to think about. And it's like, okay, well, how do I do that in order to free myself up for some of the things that might not make money immediately? So yeah, all of this to say, it's a very personal thing, but it should be all related to what you really want to achieve. <clears throat> excuse me and hopefully flexible enough that uh, when a pandemic hit, hits and you have your child at home for eight months you can you can flex um <clears throat> well yeah and we should say that I mean I pretty much never achieve my plan um a plan is a plan you know it's like um it, 
it change it obviously changes over time um but it, what's interesting is if you can try and at least get your higher level goals uh that will help you over the longer term so you'll be like yeah sure atlas is home but not forever and so what do i want up really though of that? feels like it <laughs> But, but, you know, eventually 18 years down the track, <laughs> <laughs> then it, it, it will change. But yeah. yeah, having that, what do I really want to get to eventually will help. And of course, building your creative body of work is, mm-hmm. is for us one of the most important things. And that's, you know, what I have on my wall, create a body of work I'm proud of that you know what what can I do as part of my plan that feeds into that and the money is is great but the money is all about supporting our lifestyle Mm -hmm. and there's no point in killing yourself when you know saying during COVID times you might be spending less money (laughs) yeah I think having a plan as well really helps you see like when the pandemic hit and schools closed and then we moved house and couldn't get him in a school um you know and just the length of time of him at home was just extending exponentially having a plan enabled me to see what was what was like the minimum I had to do and Mm -hmm. so despite having literally sweet fuck all time last year I still doubled the amount of books that I wrote which is absolute insanity you know but if I hadn't had a plan and a clear direction I probably would have floundered a bit more than I had um Mm -hmm. one of the other things that I just wanted to come back on um because I picked up on this when I read the book as well I love that we can I think a lot of indies in particular but writers and creatives like to learn we are learners by nature and um so there's like a you can put in into your plan because I hadn't ever done that before um that you can put in what you want to learn across a year as well so um yeah I really like that and I don't know if everybody picked up on that but you have permission to learn guys (laughs) you, you, you have to learn you absolutely have to learn because things are changing all the time and even let's again pick advertising even if you learned how to do Facebook ads four years ago you have to relearn it again if you want to reboot them because it changes all the time or for example as you say like well this year I've actually I'm doing less other stuff in order to make time to learn about how we can use AI tools as writers and even though that's not going to make me any money this year I know that that is going to supercharge my other creative goals in the future and of course I'm going to be sharing that and you know I share that stuff on on my show um but I it, I need the time to look it's an entirely new area for me Mm. so I have to allocate time for it and I'm allocating several hours every day to learn from scratch a whole load of of new things that I hope will pay off eventually but also I'm so curious about and that's another thing to say right if you want to make money in any way there are easier ways than writing books (laughs) so you have to also want to do this career so Mm. if you find your like it so let's say you've got your 1a4 page which has your plan on you've managed to winnow it down like now go through it are there things that you just go oh god I really don't want to do that or that just makes me miserable and when that happens is that something you really have to do so for example we all know social media is a bit of a nightmare uh, at the moment. And I just said, I don't want to do hardly any social media. So that's all, it's not completely gone, but I've removed a lot of that. Um, You know, I'm not doing webinars anymore. I'm not doing, I don't do consulting. Um, I'm, I'm outsourcing as much as possible of some other things in order to clear my plate. And because when I read through my plan, I was like, I really don't want to do that. So get rid of it and think about, well, what do you want to do, for example? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, once you've got your plan, uh, how how often should you review it? How often should you come back to it? Um, you know, wh- and when you do go back to it, what are you looking for um, in terms of changes and, and edits and, and removals or whatever? Mm. Well, I think the main thing is it's to kind of keep you on track. And if it really is only one A4 page or a diagram, you can stick it somewhere where you can see it. And that can really help. So the the big A2 diagram I did back in 2008 
I stuck on my wall. I had it on my wall for years. I can still picture it in my mind. And there's, um, you know, maybe we'll link to it in the show notes or something so people can see how really basic it is. But having something that helps your direction is important, especially because there are so many things that we could be learning. So a classic example in the author space is that someone will say, uh, you know, I'll get an email and somebody like, oh, you know, I really need to learn. Let's get to ads again. I really need to learn Facebook ads or Amazon ads. How do I do that? Um, or, you know, how do I upload books to Ingram Spark to get my print books out there? And I'm like, oh, OK, so, you know, where are you in your journey? Oh, I'm just writing the first draft of my book uh, or I've written three chapters of my book. It's surprising how often this happens. And the point is you need to put things on your plan that relate to your stage on the journey. And if you have not written a book, please don't think about Amazon ads or Facebook ads. Like seriously, there's just no point. And in fact, some would say if you have just one book or two books or even three books, maybe you should also be concentrating on other things. So this is really important too. Where are you in your journey? And that will help you with the level of, of things. And then in terms of revisiting it, well, you could revisit it at different points in the project uh, in the year. So let's say you're writing your first book, then you would revisit your plan after you've written that book. <laughs> um, or you could revisit your plan as I do, you know, hopefully as you do at different points in the year. So the, the end of the tax year, if you're actually running um, a business, if you're incorporated or you have a limited company or it, it, it we always have to revisit things around the end of the tax year. The other point is often the end of a calendar year. So that will be when you might review it or just after six months. So importantly, you don't have to start your plan in January and you don't have to do all a new tax year. You can start your plan anytime, but I would say at least six months, um, really. Yeah, I've, um, I have, and I, I don't know how I, have ended up doing this but I do it monthly on the first of every month um <laughs> very <and> organized <laughs> well I it's because I really fucking hate accounting and I really 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 hated getting to the end of a tax year and realizing I had done no accounting for the whole tax year so I rapidly changed that and put a process in place so I do all my account reconciliation on the first of every month I track all my stats I track all my like income out so I know what I've earned and I I guess I do both calendar year and tax year projections mm. just because I, I don't know why I do no, that, that, but I do. That's, that's excellent. And certainly the financial side is really important. And what I would say over time, so uh, one of the first things I outsourced was bookkeeping. Mm. And then, of course, if you have um, if you are incorporated, you, you have an accountant. So you do have external people that can a help you with achieving things on your plan, but also um, deadlines that you actually have to meet legally. Yeah. So yeah. that's really excellent. And that certainly goes in the financial area of, of your plan. Um, but obviously the writing process is a different may be a different part of it and also the marketing but I'm really glad you're doing that and that's the stage of the journey that you're at which some people wouldn't even be doing that because maybe they're not even making enough money although what I would say to people is if you're if you do a business plan, you are saying you want to make money with your books. And so even if your plan says, I'm going to make $10 this year, that is awesome. How are you going to make $10 this year? Um, and you can start there. And then over time, one thing on your plan might be find um, a bookkeeper that can help me. Uh, and because I can't bear to do this myself anymore. <laughs> Yeah, at the moment, I think the thing that's stopping me from getting a, pe a bookkeeper is the absolute shame over my Amazon spending. <laughs> yes, but, but they, they, they really don't care about that. I, I'm mortified. Job. I'm trying to like stop all of the, you know, Amazon. <laughs> well, I think the, the reality is that a lot of us make the most money from Amazon and spend the most money on Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> Such is life. <laughs> um, Okay, what one change either in the industry or in yourself personally um, has had the greatest like impact on your business planning um, over the years? Uh, I think it's very difficult to say what one change because because I've been doing this so long now, every year something has changed. Um, you know, for example, when I first started 
in 2008. As I said, the iPhone, I think, was launched in 2007. And mobile sales and marketing was not even a thing. I mean, people said, oh, you know, the future is mobile. And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then, you know, within a few years or eBooks at the time were downloadable PDFs. But people were charging $99 for a downloadable PDF. You know, I mean, you just can't, I hope you can't get away with that these days. <laughs> but it's like nowadays, it's, it has to be a PDF with an online course <laughs> ne next to it. But this is what's interesting. So every year when something changes, I've had to change something in my plan. So back then it might have been, uh, when I, there's a really funny video on my YouTube channel from like 2009, when I discovered print on demand, uh, which was like, oh my goodness, the whole world has changed. Print on demand is just the best thing. And so I had gone from printing copies of my books and having them in the house and trying to sell them that way to print on demand online. And then just on print, what then happened, because at the time it, CreateSpace was a separate company and Amazon bought whatever it was called before um and then it was like oh now amazon does print on demand awesome and then of course um i actually gave up print for a couple of years because it, the whole thing was just too difficult i was in australia and then i got back into print i got into ingram spark and then i got into large print and then i got into hardbacks and then i got into workbooks so all of these things that's even just print books that's almost 10 different decisions every year that would have gone on my plan of, you know, when I decided to do large print, for example, you know, I went back and did a whole load of other stuff, or even I started using my own ISBNs, you know, there are decisions that you make every year that are going to impact everything in your body of work, or for example, um, selling direct, uh, book funnel for audio came online in December, 2020. And I was like, I want to do that. And so I just went through and redid all my audio books to sell them direct through BookFunnel. And that wasn't on my plan, but what was on my plan was make more money with wide audio books and make more money selling direct, basically. So th th everything changes all the time. That's like a fundamental. So you have to be adaptable, but all of them should roll up to your overarching creative and business goals. Yeah, and I think that is a key lesson there. If you are going to be an indie, you have to be flexible. <laughs> yeah, but that's also the good thing, because if you own and control your intellectual property rights um, and, you know, your intellectual property assets and you can do these things, you can jump into new things. M most authors cannot do that cannot just jump into selling direct you know and I made like a couple of thousand dollars selling direct in December and you know doing these things that most authors can't do because they don't actually own and control or they don't control they might still own but they don't control their intellectual property so that's another mindset shift and again it will depend where you are on the journey and what your goals are but that's pretty exciting and for me that's really important I want to be able to jump on to whatever can expand and expansion is actually the word for my goal in 2021 my plan expand in all kinds of areas financially creatively in my you know intellectually that's and hopefully when we get out of the house <laughs> to do some more travel <laughs> but yeah you have to think about what is going to change and how yeah keep things flexible but equally they should still roll up to your top level of what you what you want to do with your life and what you want to achieve yeah which I'm sure for most of the uh, rebel listeners listening is probably like world domination or something so you know <laughs> um okay I have a question uh from a patron from Caitlin uh Caitlin says I'd love to know how to create an official business plan if I'm already an author I didn't create one up front and it seems overwhelming so where do I start Yes. Well, as I think as we've been talking about, it's for you wherever you are on the journey. Uh, I have obviously a lot of books and you are you have a lot of books, too, and we have plans. So it's certainly not about just creating that first book. I'd say that's probably more like a project plan. If you're just doing one book, it's a project plan to get that book to publication. But um, certainly a business plan you can do at any point. What I recommend doing is starting where you are. So actually get out your whatever you're going to do and actually say, okay, what do I have? So do you have one book? 
for example. If you have one book, probably on your plan is you're going to have the major thing is your production plan, which is how do I write more books? I'm, and so maybe your goal this year is to write the next book. <laughs> and that literally, that could be your entire plan. And it probably should be at that point in your journey. Um, so start with where you are and then look at what's the next step in the, in the direction I want to go. That's really important. So you and I are both podcasters, pretty addicted to podcasting. It's creative, it's marketing, it makes money. Therefore, it is a good thing to do. But if, if you're a lot of authors are starting podcasts, but possibly not with the right direction, as in, um, you know, does it underpin your other goals? And is your podcast topic something that underpins your other goals? So you and I both have nonfiction books, which mm -hmm. are the obvious thing that you have out of a podcast. I do have my books and travel podcast, which tangentially gets people into my fiction, but very tangentially. <laughs> so essentially you have to, you know, if you're just starting on your plan, think about what you have now and then what is the next logical step in the direction you want to go? Yeah. And so thinking about um, like writers who are trying to create their plans, what are the most common mistakes uh, you, 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 you see writers making when trying to do their business plan? I think you've mentioned like trying to cram in everything, but is there anything else you've seen um, that writers do? Yeah, well, trying to cram too much is the, probably the biggest thing. Um, and the other thing is probably trying to make it too long a timeline. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, both of us have longer term plan. Like I have on my wall here, 50 books by 50. <laughs> And I'm, I'm, our birthdays are at similar time and uh, I'm 46 this year. So I would, according to my schedule, I'm going to have to seriously speed up if I want to make 50 books by 50, <laughs> but I'm not going, I, it's, I don't know if I'm going to make that goal, to be honest, <laughs> because the, well, the thing that's above it is create a body of work I'm proud of. So I'm not just going to throw books out there. They have to be books I want to write and that, um, that I'm, I'm proud of. So I think trying to put things, trying to put too much in would be one thing trying to put too much too soon in um so for example if you're just writing your first book you don't have a business plan for the first year that says make six figures you just mm. can't you well I say you it's very unlikely <laughs> that you can do that or win the booker prize very unlikely you're going to do that with your with your first book so that would be um another issue um the other thing is putting things in that you think you should do that don't excite you so again coming back to the ads we most people don't want to do ads like they really don't so you have to think well what can I do that works for me for example I have found for my fiction that doing book bub ads is the thing I can bear because book bub ads are actually not very complicated <laughs> compared to say Facebook and Amazon um so you have to be thinking about that too and just go gentle on yourself. You know, I think that's another thing we've all learned during the pandemic is you have to look after your mental health and your physical health. And look, if you hate, hate stuff, just don't do it. So I did uh, back in April, 2020, I 10X my fiction revenue using ads. I was so proud of myself and I hated it so much. I was like, I hate, I just hate this. I hate doing this. So I was like, well, stop it then. Life is literally too short. So now I just run book bub ads, which I enjoy doing. Well, you know, and I just don't have to do them very often. <laughs> so that's a decision I made that was away from money, but towards mental health. And so that would probably be another overarching thing. Uh, you know, is this the life you want? <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that makes complete sense. I have the same issue with uh, advertising fiction because it's just so, I just, it's so complicated to try and do all of the the fiction mm. advertising. With the non-fiction, I just shove up some AMS ads and they, oh. the money rolls in, you know? Like non, it's so... Non-fiction is so easy. <gasps> I but know. I would say, um, for me, uh, so David Gochran's book, uh, Book by yeah. Ads Expert, I think it is. That book is awesome. And I had Dave on my show uh, August or September or something last year to talk about it. But essentially that book really helped me 
Um, and now I just, I, and the other thing I wrote down, it's actually a Tim Ferriss thing coming back to Tim Ferriss, who I have a sort of love hate relationship with Tim Ferriss. Like, <laughs> but um, one of the things he talked about once was the question, what would it look like if, it, if this was easy? Like really, mm. what would this look like if it was easy? And it comes to, for me, for fiction, it comes down to first book in a series at permanently free or 99 cents and run book bub ads on that book. That and paper click ads. If people listening don't understand what I mean, well, I'm talking paper click ads, not book bub featured deals, which you can't guarantee. Whereas your your paper click ads, you can. And again, this is getting a bit granular for a plan, but on my plan, it said, sell more fiction <laughs> but not at the expense of my mental health or my time so I've now settled on something that achieves part of my goal but achieves the goal of actually giving me more time to do what I love okay so another question from a patron uh, this one's from Cassie uh, and she and just to uh, point out neither of us I don't think you're an account uh, qualified accountant are you past no of course no, not. Okay. no. Right. my degree is so, in theology <laughs> <laughs> yeah not not accountancy then um <laughs> and I am definitely not an accountant I hate numbers anyway so Cassie says um and this is a question I see come up quite a lot when mm. is it necessary to become a company and to incorporate um uh as an author is it when you're at a certain profit point and um or, or you know should you just stay as a sole trader now before you answer obviously it's different in every country isn't it you know mm. we have limited companies in the UK and it's LLC or whatever it is in America so it's always better to consult with a an accountant I suppose or or a lawyer yeah someone who specializes in that in your jurisdiction but first up I'd say starting a business is at first a mindset so you're gonna say yes I'm going to run my author business that doesn't mean you have to incorporate at all. And in fact, most authors will spend a good amount of time before they take it any further. But what I would recommend is setting up a separate bank account. So this can just be a separate personal bank account or a, you know, some kind of account that is separate that you fund from your other account and you spend out of and you um, put money into. So that is your business account even though it doesn't have to be associated with a business because then you're actually assuming the mindset of a business person and then what you have to consider do your research as you say consult with a professional um if you i mean you're going to need to do certain legal things uh, to set up a business, but also to run a business. So there are overheads. So for example, doing, and I always recommend obviously having an accountant do your accounts because they know what they're doing and we are <laughs> writers. Um, and in fact, even if you are an accountant writer, you know, possibly you might want someone else to do, do your books. But if you do incorporate, I would say it's got to be worth it financially to incorporate. So you're, you know, if you're making a couple of grand a year, then you're not going to incorporate or create a business or whatever the terminology is in your country. Um, there are some people who say 30,000, 50,000, you know, US dollars a year. But again, each of the jurisdictions will have its own thing. There are a lot of benefits for your business, especially if you're speaking or doing other things that do involve liability, there's asset protection, there's, you know, estate management things, there are lots of benefits of having a business that go beyond the financials, you know, a, a change in your tax situation, for example. But again, it can be just as simple as starting out with a separate bank account and a mindset that says I'm going to do this. And then again, it's looking at each of the stages that you are coming up to don't get ahead of yourself in thinking well what am I going to do when I'm making this amount of money how am I going to run these things well to be honest that will come up as you get closer to that so uh, just start with that mindset and then re start researching in your jurisdiction what is most appropriate and read um, Business for Authors by Joanna Penn. <laughs> Is that the title? Have I got it the right way around? Yeah, but business, but I don't, I mean, I have some thoughts in there, but Business for Authors, it doesn't say like at this threshold, start no. a business or anything. It's just some more principles around running a business. But yeah, I think, uh, but I like the fact, I, I think that the mindset is really 
important to start with and then over time so for, you know you have to then think about all kinds of different tax issues when you set up a business than you do as a sole trader or whatever you want to say so but it, but the point is it doesn't ha- you don't have to have a business to have a plan for example yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's talk about that really uncomfortable topic that I absolutely love. Money. <laughs> I was going to I... say, do you think anyone listening to your show has an issue with money? I don't know. <laughs> I hope not. I hope you all love it. Um, so, uh, you, but the, I, I guess it's true because lots of writers either don't want to have a relationship with money, they don't mm. like having a relationship with money, or they don't have a great relationship with money. So there's lots of like negative stigmas, lots of poor mindsets around money. And I, you know, I had to come through um, paying off a lot of debt from, you know, uni and, and other crap um, and uh, to get to where I am today. And it, and it has taken work. And, and but to run a successful business, we actually have to be comfortable with money. Mm. Um, so what can writers do to improve their money mindset um, or get better with money for the long term and have a, a financially healthier business? Well, I mean, we talked about learning earlier and this would be an area that we could all do. I mean, I read a lot of money books. I listen to a lot of money podcasts. I I get um, here in the UK, I get a magazine called Money Week, which comes every Friday. Uh, I read the Financial Times. And but five years ago, (laughs) we have this thing called ISAs in the UK, which in America are called IRAs and other people have different things. But when my husband suggested back in and I don't think I've ever shared this publicly. This is just for you, Sasha. Um, Basically, when I I'd resigned my job, this is 20. 11 2011 yeah so 2011 and my husband's like we should really put money into an ISA we should start investing and and putting money away and I I burst into tears I could not fathom the idea of putting any money into something that it wasn't available to my immediate use that essentially I was going to try how could I possibly think about investing in the future when I was I didn't even have enough money to run my business right now and we were living in a one-bedroom flat we downsized and all this stuff and I just burst into tears and I remember that moment as a moment where I thought do you know what I thought I was good with the whole money mindset and I clearly am not what is going on fast forward now you know almost a decade later uh, we all have to work on these things and um, I invest a pretty big chunk of my of my money um, into uh, ISA and also uh, my pension my SIP uh, here in the UK personally managed because you know I've upskilled and all that so that's probably the first thing is however you are now you can change your mindset and by literally just getting educated. And I, I don't know how, what percentage it is of people who actually have any form of financial education. And I don't mean accounting. I mean, actual education around how to make money and keep money. I've always been good at making money, but keeping it and investing it and having money make money. That is something that I just, just didn't know. And my family, you know, teachers, they're not, people who know about that so um i've got a list of books at the creativepen.com forward slash money books uh you know i'm you've i think didn't you do a book with jay thorne on on this about money um but i read all the time and the other thing to say is it's just another language there are words that you might not understand like i just mentioned iso or ira you might not know what that is or why you'd even bother there's a good start. (laughs) Um, So get comfortable with the language. Once you're comfortable with the language, things will really change. It's a bit like when you first self-publish and if people are coming into it, there's all this language we all use. Like we've just talked about book bub ads and all that. People are like, what, what, sorry, what did you say? What do you mean? What's Ingram Spark? What's this? That's it. It's just a language. And once you understand it, you can act in the space in a much more confident way so that would be the the first thing is money education financial education um it doesn't have to be a degree it can literally be books that you buy and read or listen to podcasts um choose fi uh, choose financial independence that's a really good show um and there are also good books for whatever stage you're at so for example um the, the millennial group uh, I can't quit like a millionaire quit like a millionaire is my favorite millennial money book that is brilliant absolutely brilliant and then there are different uh, sort of things for, for different age groups so 
to be honest, that's probably my biggest recommendation because if you upskill and like, again, wherever you are. So for example, I make um, multi six figures and I've made that for four years, four, four or five years now in a row. My income has been, yeah, about the same every year. So then the question becomes, okay, well, do I want to take it up a level? And how would I do that? Because I'm now the only person in my business how do you do that as a solopreneur without being Mark Dawson or Lindsay Broker? <laughs> um, how do you do, or do I want that? Like, what does that mean? Uh, and how do these different things work? So there's always another level you can get to. Um, and how do you want to treat that? Or for example, how do I, what, what do I really value? Like I really value travel and I, I, I'm saving up for when we, <laughs> we can do some and I'm happy to spend money on that. But we don't have a car. Um, um, we have a, you know, modest house. Uh, don't spend on that type of thing. So you have to choose where to put your money. Um, but certainly the education side, I think, is really important. What, what are your thoughts on that? Because you've certainly, I know you, you have, you're on the journey. Like yeah. So um, it, it's interesting because I want to continue to increase my income. Um, but I know there will be a point that I will get to uh with this business where I will not want to um I don't want to publish other people particularly I don't mind doing some co-writing projects that's fine but I have no desire to publish other people I don't really want to work with other people um me too yeah <laughs> I, I like co-writing occasionally but you know other than that I don't want to partner with anybody um so for me I uh we're saving for a second property uh mm. I feel very uh, very strongly that I want to like I want to uh, continue always to grow my income but not necessarily always from this type of income mm. stream so for me um I would like we would like to buy enough properties that um my wife can leave her job and do property management she's super handy she's a qualified electrician uh, even uh. though she's in education um yeah so we would probably look at that um and investments as well and dividends and all that kind of stuff but I don't really want to I don't I this job is so fun I don't ever want to force myself to write fast just to go into KU just to you know I I love this so much because I love what I do and I never want money to change that I just enjoy writing the books at the pace I write the books and at the quality you know continuing to learn and do my craft so I don't yeah I don't know I I, I want to hit certain figures with this with this particular business but then my mm. income streams will I think divert out um, yeah and that's that's really important um just on the property so I got into that um you know back in would have been uh, 2006 to 8 ish we got into property development um uh, doing up properties you know and I decided then because I same as you probably actually similar age to you then um but <laughs> not handy husband is a statistician um yeah I mean the fact that Chloe wants to a wants to do that and b actually has skills mm -hmm. uh these are things that make that appropriate for you to think about and because I went through that myself and just went you know I hate this the, like the best way to make money is to really care about getting yeah. a good deal on carpet or whatever yeah. <laughs> and I'm like I just don't literally don't care. So it's very interesting because, of course, property is something that, you know, some people do. And I think if you love it, then it's definitely a good way. We've decided that's not for us. So we have other ways of, of um, having other streams of income. But the main point is exactly what you're saying is when we talk about multiple streams of income, it's not just multiple books it's not yes. just multiple stores it's not just services as well it's not just all these things that are still reliant on you and me and this is a big thing okay um we're again we're in pandemic times so what happens if you get sick if chloe gets sick if um and you can't do some of this stuff or what you or what if we die? <laughs> we are going to die, by the way. Hopefully it'll be a while. But how, you know, I, I, yeah, I've put things in place that will still bring in revenue after, after I die. That's pretty exciting, actually. Um, but also, how do we manage writing the things we love? Like you said, I mean, I have things I want to write <laughs> that might not make, well, in fact, 
already many of the things I write don't make much money. <laughs> so how do we make sure we can do more of the creation we love, knowing that our needs are taken care of from these other streams? And again, I would say to people, think about bringing in the money, but also keeping the money. And mm-hmm. how does that sort of self-perpetuate and that was the mistake and it was a mistake I made in 13 years of being an IT consultant I had literally nothing to show for it except a lot of great memories (laughs) because I had not put money away for the future and it was before mandatory superannuation or mandatory pension Mm -hmm. so that if I had just figured that out earlier on in my life like in my 20s I probably would actually be retired by now Um, and when we talk about retired obviously like like you I'm not giving this up but I do have a number in mind that I want to get to with my investments so that I have more choice Mm -hmm. Um, and again like we just you just don't know do you You don't know what's going to happen and you have to have money put aside for difficult times Um, so but again what I would say is that is a stage that you will hit Uh, if you have a day job right now that deals with that then awesome keep your day job while you build the other stuff up at, at the side or maybe always have a day job that can also be a thing so there are a lot of choices but again, reading some of these books is a, is a great way to go and get ideas about what's possible. Yeah. Um, OK, so I am well aware that uh, we are now uh, on the ticking clock. However, I do have to ask my very favourite question, <laughs> the compulsory <laughs> question of this show. This is the Rebel Author Podcast. So can you tell us about a time you unleashed your inner rebel? <laughs> Well, I was thinking about this because I don't actually think I am a rebel. I'm, <gasps> I'm actually a good girl. I really, I, I'm a really good girl. I like being told, well done, you know, God. in fact, I give myself, I'm going to show you on the video. I know people won't be able to hear this, but this is, these are my stickers. I've got my gold star stickers by my desk because if I do a good job, I get a sticker in my journal. <laughs> I love I mean, that so much. Literally, I'm so not a rebel. Like, how many rebels have stickers by there? <laughs> I have I have a whole drawer of stickers. I, I protest. <laughs> okay, well, I, I think, I think, but it's interesting because uh, although I don't often consider myself a rebel, I have been told by people who are in the more traditional industry that I'm some kind of, maybe radical might be a, a, a more of a word. Um, I'm st- I certainly don't feel like I'm rebelling against the traditional industry or I'm rebelling against the way that, you know, you should be an author, but I do feel like I... Um, I do push in directions that some people resist. So for example, the AI, writing with AI, writing with artificial intelligence is something I know people are very unhappy or feel afraid of. And I'm embracing the fear and running towards it um, because I see that AI can augment us and that as we, as you and I have just been talking about with the uh, solopreneur, how do you increase your income as a solopreneur without compromising who you are and doing things that you can't or won't do? So for me, when I look at artificial intelligence tools, for example, you and I um, do Amazon ads for our nonfiction. Mine are, many of them are auto ads. They're running on the algorithm. My German ads are all auto ads because I don't speak German. So using artificial intelligence tools to do something that we don't even have to manage, that is giving us leverage. So I would say perhaps my rebel side is, or my my radical side is looking, is pushing the boundaries of what's possible for creatives in order to enable us to to do more things, to do the more of what we want to do as opposed to what we don't want to do, and that has to be the goal, right? <laughs> Yeah, and I, so when I when I obviously sent you this question, I wondered if you would talk about AI because you are um, I don't know how to describe it, but you do like you see what's coming, and uh, yeah, you run towards it, and that is definitely a rebellious um, side, a rebellious streak because you know there are so such a tiny percentage of people who um, have the the balls or the vagina, let's say, to do that um, and to to like you know run to towards the big scary, you know, and and what is it like? there's the the uptake 
curve and it's like the early adopters or whatever you're like ahead of the early adopters that's totally radical but, so. it, but it's so interesting you say that and yeah okay so as we record this my next podcast so um if people want to look at the ai stuff it's the creative pen.com forward slash future where i'm linking to all this but i'm interviewing a sri lankan author i've got a few authors coming on who are already writing with gpt3 and other ai tools and I thought I was ahead of the curve, but these are books that are already being sold out there and people actually doing stuff. So although I am someone who does push the boundaries, I'm certainly not ahead of the curve. I just hope I can push it into more of the mainstream. And, um, you know, again, I'm not a programmer. My degree is theology. And so maybe I am the, the next one after the programmers to, to kind of come into something. But I do hope like circling way back to our business plan um, on my business plan this year, I have a number of experiments. So one experiment is co-write with an AI tool co-write maybe a short story or something that that's on my list my plan for this year and again that doesn't feed into making money but it sh sure as hell feeds into where I want to go over the next decade so hopefully that sort of helps people put that into perspective amazing tell listeners where they can find out more about you podcast books courses all that good stuff Sure. Well, The Creative Pen, pen with a double N, web, webcast, webcast, podcast, website, Twitter, um, all of those things. So thecreativepen.com is probably uh, the best place. And my fiction is jfpen.com. And it's not at all science fiction. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for your time today. I It has genuinely been such an honour and a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, thanks for having me on, Sasha. And thank you to all of uh, the show's listeners. And of course, a huge thank you to the show's patrons. I'm Sasha Black. You were listening to Joanna Penn. And this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Next week, I'm joined by Gail Carragher, and it is one hell of an episode. I personally have about 800 epiphanies during the, sh the show, so I hope that you also learn as much from Gail as I did. So yes, join me next week for that. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review.